My humble respect to Guru Mahan, Guru Piran Sri Sangaran, Guru Piran Nyo, fellow Nyanis. Um, we are still in the discussion on the monoism uh, and the reason why we are spending some time here is because much of Mahan's teachings is Advaita teachings. So, and uh, uh, though Mahan has uh, given a very short description of Advaita, I want to give you a more detailed analysis of Advaita. I want to expose you to the different models of describing Advaita, so that even if you don't understand the concepts, uh, you understand the models. And the models are, you know, a good way of, uh, a systematic way of understanding, uh, you know, Advaitic teachings and Dvaitwa. Uh, so you'll see that some uh, element and convergence of between the two, which is really important because sometimes people see it distinctively. But when you see in the model, you see that it's actually the models are much more universal and captures uh, the different schools of thoughts quite nicely. Uh, and I always felt that uh, in this journey of spirituality, sometimes the concepts can be very abstract. And having examples, uh, and you remember the examples, in the, you know, and you can you know, observe the examples and introspect and contemplate over it. And you'll see that you know, there is a lot of it's, it's important examples of, you know, from nature itself to tell us the nature of our own self. So today I'm going to spend some time about the ocean wave model or the wave ocean model, whatever people call it. You may have heard about it in a, in a kind of a simplified way. I'm going to take you a little bit more deeper in the understanding of uh, you know, the ocean wave model, um, you know, uh, deeply introspecting using Mahan's lens and you'll get a more deeper understanding of these concepts. So we see that, uh, you know, all of us, you know, at some point, you know, have been to the beach and we have seen the ocean, we've been, you know, we've seen the waves and often, you know, we have just, you know, experienced it, but we perhaps have not given deep thought of what this ocean and wave is in the context of who we are as a being. So here, uh, you know, I want to come back to uh, Mahan's uh, um, description of what uh, monoism or Advaitic is actually those who have realized the true self. And that is this oneness, everything is this one and there's no two. And here he says that those that have realized their own true self by the experience of the intellect and do not worship anything of what he says, pure monoism. Everything is one and they see this as one integrated um, you know, a uh, system or one integrated reality. And given, given this, then why is it that we see multiplicity and why is it we see duality? And I gave you some description of why that is the case. In Dvaitva, we spoke about nature, uh, God and sentient beings, this, that relationship. Uh, in Dvaitva, you see that through bhakti and jnana, the mind goes deeper inside, within ourselves, absorbed you know, absorbed in that state of God realization and, you know, obtain the grace of God. And there's a convergence between the self, nature, and God. And in Advaita, um, which is, um, you know, uh, it also, it, it starts off with oneness. And it gives a description of why we see separateness. And it talks about, you know, uh, the various, you know, Maya and, you know, Avitya and so on. And the way to get back is to introspection, contemplation, reflection, and meditation. And you see that when you really uh, go intensive in the, in, in the analysis, you will see that everything is that one reality. As Swamiji used to say, Utru, Utru, Noka, Noka, Ipparamum, Apparamum, Yega, Paraparamum, Innu, Nanadete. He says that by intensive introspection, you know, intensive observation, you know, an intensive vichara, one will see that the inner and the external cosmos are the same, one, the one reality. And I'm going to show you with some examples that is used in the Advaita Vedanta uh, on describing this. All of us are familiar with the wave and ocean model. And, uh, you know, we know that uh, only in the ocean that we get waves. 
right? And, and we see the whole question is that, are the waves different from the ocean? Or is the ocean separate from the waves? And this is something that we want to see, what is the relationship between the wave ocean model and our own self, right? So what are the key characteristics? And I'd like to, you know, whenever I see a model, I like to understand the characteristics of it so that we have a pretty good understanding of what's this model trying to describe. Uh, so the waves has continuous flow and we see water, you know, coming to the shore and then going back, you know, and sometimes the waves are high and sometimes they are low, you know? So we see this flow that is continuously there in that uh, ocean. It's back and forth, you know? And how is that related to us? And we see that uh, we too have this continuous flow and that continuous flow is our thoughts. You know, we see that the thoughts start, that it sustains for a while, then it peaks and then it dissolves. And the highs are our sukhas, things we get very exuberant, we get happy, you know, very high feeling, nice feeling. And the dukkha is the ones that are very challenging and, you know, things that we don't like, we get a, Sometimes, you know, we feel down, you know, sometimes we feel depressed, you know, so things go through that stages. And interestingly, these experiences, we experience this in our waking state, but it goes into silence in our deep sleep or in our deep meditation state. So this continuous flow is there like the ocean uh, that has waves. We too go through that. When we go to bed, all our thoughts just goes to sleep. So we see this parallel between the wave ocean model that we too have that waves and that inner ocean, you know, you can call it the infinite or the formless or the dimensionless or big eye or, you know, there are many descriptions that are given Atma and so on. So whatever it is, I don't wanna get caught in the semantics. Let's, you know, keep the focus on there is a continuous flow that we experience through, you know, various thoughts and experiences up and down you know, and it goes all to a state of silence. So this is what all of us go through and you see that the parallels between the wave ocean model in all of us. So the question I always ask is that what causes that waves? The waves are there. So we need to really understand what the causes are. If we understand the causes, then we can say, how do we manage those causes? And this is the part that is really important. As I mentioned, the spiritual compass you know a phenomena is taking place. You must ask the question, why is the phenomena taking place? And you cannot take a dogmatic approach. If you take a dogmatic approach, you say, well, it happens, so I can't do anything about it, right? That's not uh, vichara. If something happens, one needs to ask, what are the underlying causes of this, right? Is there anything I can do? And this is what we see that we take a scientific approach you know, as I mentioned, you know, both in the Dvaita and Advaita, the scientific lens is there embedded. This is called vichara. And another aspect is actually the logical, using logic and reason to be able to understand what's causing this. So when we look at the, the, the oceans and the waves, we see that there are a number of things that causes these waves. We have wind, we have different pressure, you know, atmospheric pressures that, that changes. We also have man-made disturbances, you know, for example, if a, a, a major, um, you know, boat passes by, you will get the waves, the ripples in the water, right? Uh, we also have this gravitational pull, you know, the, the gravitational pull between sun and the moon has an impact on uh, the water, the way the oceans that, that we live in, right? And also we do have this underwater disturbances. And sometimes, you know, we have the tectonic shift that takes place because of earthquake or major landslide or volcanic eruption. We see that, you know, sometimes it creates wave and in the extreme cases, it creates tsunamis. And uh, so this causes, uh, you know, some of the waves, you know, some of them are small waves, some of them are really big waves, some of them are really dangerous uh, waves like tsunamis that can wipe out uh, land and people, right? So mm -hmm. this similar parallel of these waves are also the causes. You can see a very parallel in all of us. So we see that, you know, we have wind that's causing this. In us, the thoughts and the, the turbulence is caused by winds of materiality, right? So we have these desires that we have, you know, we have great desires, you know, 
all that creates a lot of turbulence, right? And sometimes the desires are very successful and you know, we get you know, very happy feeling, you know, exuberance, the sugar waves are very high. But there are times that we also have uh, things don't turn out as we want. And we have disappointments, you know, uh, we have challenges, we have a lot of pressures, we get go through a lot of uh, intensive, uh, you know, uh, pressure that causes a lot of turbulence. So that too has an impact, you know, that creates the turbulence in our mind. There are other things as man-made, you know, things like our own behavior, you know, we are harsh to people, we are nasty to people and they react in that same way. So sometimes our own behavior causes, you know, uh, unnecessary pressure. And sometimes, you know, our good behavior also generates, you know, uh, calm and sublimity and positivity. In the same parallel, we see that, it, as I mentioned, gravitational pull, we also have in that context of us, we see that the people around us and the things that we associate with do has a, have an impact. If we have positive people, we see that we imprint positive waves, positive thoughts, you know, and if you associate with positive things, you know, doing charitable work, helping NGOs, you know, doing things that that gives us purpose and meaning, we generate those positive uh, waves and thoughts. So we see that how we react to things and how the forces of what the people around us, the things that we interact with also uh, generates that waves. That's what the sun and the moon has an impact on the earth, the, the oceans on earth. And, and the last one is actually on in terms of, you know, the uh, disturbances, these are, you know, like underwater disturbances that shifts things. There are times that major calamities happen uh, in our own lives, you know, accidents or, you know, death or uh, disease or things that really uh, has a major changes in our lives. And uh, again, we see that, you know, this, uh, you know, sometimes it could be for a short period of time and sometimes it could have a longer term impact. So again, we see that whatever it is, uh, it does cause that waves and you know the turbulence in many of us. So these are some of the kind of uh, understanding of why um, at the surface of our life, we see so many waves. Some of it's up, some of it is down, you know, and, and we go through this flow day in, day out. So we see this, so one, uh, once you understand this, uh, this, uh, this phenomena, then I want to come back to, so as long as we are in the surface, we go through this uh, impact. So, you know, uh, and, uh, and something very interesting that happens that we'll see uh, that um, I want to go a little bit more deeper uh, in terms of the wave ocean model. So if you see that on the surface of the ocean, if you see the ocean, there are waves. Uh, we see that you know many things that are out there uh, impacts the the ocean the surface of the ocean as i mentioned the sun's radiation you know the electromagnetic field we have the heat that dissipates you know we have wind we have uh, you know uh, a whole range of turbulence that is generated by these external material uh, things out there and um, you know i won't go into detail you can read this on your own but clearly, as long as you are in the surface, um, you know, you're impacted by the forces of nature. And you see that some of the water molecules, you know, evaporate, you know, winds of change happens, you have heat flux, you know, you have a whole range of things. And the same thing happens to all of us. As long as we are in the surface, things around us, things, you know, that we interact with has an impact on us. Sometimes there are things that, that are not related to us, but does impact us, you see? So we see this, uh, this, this thing happening to all of us. And, uh, and this is what the wave ocean model tries to describe. Now, as I mentioned, as long as you are in the surface, we will be impacted by this material world. You know, sun, heat, the whole range of things. But as we go deeper, uh, this is the part that is really important. As we go deeper, transition from that surface to the inner realm of ourselves. That means we are moving from our senses 
you know, slowly silencing our senses to go deeper and deeper, ultimately silencing our mind is somewhat like going deeper into that ocean. And as we go deeper, all the waves that we experience slowly starts disappearing, disappear, right? As it starts disappearing, suddenly as you go, you can see the fish that is swimming beautifully. Before in the surface, you can't see. But now as you go deeper, the scenery becomes more clear, clearer. You know, you can see all the beautiful fishes that are passing through, you're silently observing them, right? And the same thing, as you go deeper, you see that the light and the material forces starts dissipating. And as you go deeper and deeper, you see that the material world starts quietening. The material forces starts quietening. And eventually you start feeling a strong current that starts, you know, having its own flow in beneath the ocean. In the same way, we see that as we go deeper within ourselves, we see that the forces of materiality become, starts dissipating. You start becoming more transcendental and you start feeling that inner current within yourself. This is the Unarva that Mahan speaks about. So as we go deeper, something very interesting, we ask the question, then what are we? You know, we are feeling all these thoughts and experiences and all this thing that is, you know, giving us that personality, you know, and, uh, but as we go deeper, all that disappears. Somewhat like, you know, when we go to sleep, all our material personality disappears, right? So the question then is that, what are you? Are you the wave or are you the ocean that is much more broader? And this is the question that many great saints and sages, you know, start asking, you know, am I this personality that is continuously changing, going through the suga and dukkha? Or am I, there is something that is far greater. And this is, you know, as they started going deeper and deeper, they start saying, hey, my personality, which is so fleeting and changing, becomes, you know, more porous. I, be, I, I get a sense of eternality. I get a sense of transcendentality. I get a sense of universality. And you see that as I come deeper and deeper, I understand all those things in the surface that impact me, but I also understand within me there is a much more grander and a greater uh, personality. So if we ask this question, so when I show you this picture, then the question I have is that, are you the wave or are you the ocean, right? And this is a question that we can discuss later, right? But nevertheless, you know, if you see that the waves are part of the ocean, you see, and, but even you're in the wave, you don't feel it. You, you feel that, you know, there's a lot of turbulence until and unless you go deep down, we realize there is a sublimity and serenity that gives us a better understanding of the forces that lie within that ocean. So uh, great saints and sages say, we are that one ocean, you know, and that, that one ocean, when you're in the surface, the ocean's uh, personality is very different. It is reacting to the material world. It has this turbulence, it has its ups and downs, but that's part of that reality at the surface. But when you go deep down, it is much more calmer. We are that one, you know? And if you understand this, he says that while you're at the surface, you're not impacted by all this. You are the wave, you enjoy the wave, you ride the wave, you experience that, that different changes, but knowing that you are, Still, while the change is happening at the surface, deep down, you are unchanging. So this is what the Advaitic teaching uh, is, is that we are one. Though on the surface, we are continuously changing, you know, this is part and parcel of the limitedness of our four-dimensional material universe with time. But deep down, we are timeless, formless, dimensionless. So again, uh, I come back to asking this question, what are you, you know? What have you experienced? And we see that those who meditate deep have that deep, intensive introspection, contemplation, reflection, and meditation will know this truth that, you know, uh, I am that one, and that one interacts with many things in this, you know, 
experiences the material world and see this multiplicity, you know, in this multiplicity or infinite, infinite potentiality and possibilities, I am still that infinite. So this is the, the Advaitic teaching of to show you that the relationship, there's a strong relationship between the ocean and wave. Without the wave, without the ocean, there is no wave, right? But without the wave, the ocean can still sustain. So the whole idea of the Advaitic teaching is that, yes, in the surface, we'll experience all this, but we are that one ocean. We are that one universal truth. So understanding that, so a mind that understands this universal truth is you know, universal and transcendental, though it interacts with this material world and is inspired and, and, and illumined by these different changes that is taking place and is enriched by it. So this is the, the wave ocean model. Uh, <clears throat> so the question then is, that how do I reduce the turbulence in our mind? Great, all this is fantastic, you know, uh, uh, but how do I actually do this? You know, uh, I'm experiencing the surface turbulence. What do I need to do uh, to be able to be transcendental? And, and let's look at some of the causes that causes this turbulence, right? So I come back to this, this uh, five key uh, causes that uh, causes turbulence in us. The winds of materiality, the desires, right? And, and what does the Advaitic um, you know, masters say, like Mahan and others? So we see that, you know, what are the causes of this uh, multiplicity? We see that it is uh, avidya, varna, and, and, uh, and maya. So how do we overcome this? And I spoke about introspection, contemplation, reflection, meditation. But more in a more practical sense, how do we transcend the turbulence? So the first one is winds of materiality, the desires. You know, to overcome that, that, that you know, exuberance and, and the depression, one needs to learn to divinize the desires. And the divinizing desires are, you know, know where the desires are coming from, what's the purpose of the desires, and, and how one makes the desire more divinized. So, you know, if you see, uh, this is where this notion of dharma, artha, karma, and moksha is very important acquire the knowledge to help you divinize every facet of your thoughts and ambitions and aspirations. You know, and you know, you can, we can discuss this a little bit more. How do I take my desires and make it more divinized? There are ways to do this. And uh, as you go deeper and as through this introspection, contemplation, reflection, you'd get the jnana to observe every desire of yours and make it illumined make it enriched and make it enlightened. The answer comes from you. So the first aspect of this uh, turbulence that is caused by the winds of materiality because of desires, one will need to learn to divinize the desire, not you know, run away from the desire or give up the desire, divinize the desire. The second aspect is that the pressures, the disappointment challenges, right? We all get challenges, we all get disappointed, but you know, yes, it's, 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 it's human nature to go through this, but we have to learn to accept everything. You know, even though there are challenges and disappointments and failures, you know, one needs to learn to use that as a foundation for our enlightenment and enrichment. There is no successful person has become successful without disappointment and challenges. They have learned to transform scars into stars, impossible into I am possible, and these pressures into treasures of learning and enlightenment. The pressures into treasures, a you know, foundation for the next stage of development. So we see this, you know, learning to accept everything and not expecting anything. Just do it. When you expect things, this is when sometimes when you don't get it, you uh, get disappointed. When you don't expect and something happens, think of it as a bonus, think of it as a blessing, think of it as you know, a part and parcel of that en enlightenment and enrichment. So this is the second uh, dot point on learning to transform pressures into treasures. The third aspect is man-made. Most of the waves are man-made because of our behavior, because of the way we, we speak or the way we 
think or the way we action our, you know, uh, things, you see. And I've seen many people have got themselves into trouble because the way they speak to people, you know, uh, the lack of politeness, the lack of grace, the lack of, uh, you know, grace in thought, speech and behavior. Even if you disagree, it's okay, but be very tactful, be very gentle, be very kind. And this is where, you know, I see that a lot of conflicts happen because of our own behavior. So one needs to learn to modify the thoughts, the speech and behavior. You see that, you know, as you progress in your um, this pursuit of spiritual life, you see that we become more and more refined in our thoughts, in our speech and our behavior. Somewhat like the Hamsa, very, you know, learn to glide beautifully, looks very majestic, even the, in, during the most difficult period. You know, unlike a duck that is continuously quacking away. So we see that a man made, uh, you know, turbulence can be overcome through our own, you know, uh, reform and refinement. The fourth aspect is the gravitational pull, the people that we associate with. Sometimes the people we associate with can, have, you know, impact us and have the turbulence. If you associate with people who are negative, who are very, uh, you know, always critical, always, uh, you know, uh, um, get into all the difficult things, uh, you see that, you know, our behavior also will become uh, that way. This is called the osmosis, you know. If you are among spiritual people, you know, people who are inspirational, people who are positive can do, you see that that spiritual osmosis, uh, you know, percolates in your mind and you too become inspirational. That is why there is a beautiful saying that you want to know um, how what's the state of your mind and thoughts. Look at the people that you are associating with, right? So again, you know, we see that that gravitational pull, how the sun and the moon has an impact on the Earth's oceans. In that same way, our gravitational pull uh, will determine that is the people that are around us, the orbit that we in will determine actually on this underwater disturbances, the major calamities in our life that impact us. We need, so, so there are things that happens, you know, we may not know why it happens or how it happens. But one thing we know that many of it, you know, is because there are structural changes that happen in our life, you know. And the way to overcome this is that we need to understand and master the power of the underlying substratum in us. So within us, if we learn to master this, we are able that the mind becomes like a sponge to absorb it, assimilate it, integrate it, and, and become enlightened by it. It uses this inner substratum as a shock absorber to manage any major calamities and turbulence. Death, disease, or poverty is able to absorb, assimilate, integrate, and become enlightened by it. So this is where we see that going deep down um, enables us to overcome these turbulence. So as long as we are on the surface and the turbulence, if our learning and our jnana is at the surface level, not deep, we will always experience this turbulence. If our knowledge becomes deep and wide, like the ocean, we will learn to divinize our desire. We will be le we le we learn to accept everything and anything. You know, we are able to sustain everything and anything, like the ocean. We are able to, you know, transform and modify our thoughts and speech to become more refined and more graceful. We're able to associate with people of multitude and infinite potential from diverse areas and diverse knowledge that we're able to acquire. And ultimately, we're able to anchor the mind so that the mind is powered by the inner substratum of the force so that it's able to absorb, you know, adapt, assimilate, integrate, and be enlightened, you know, by everything that is happening to us. And we see that the mind becomes ultimately transcendental to everything and universal. And this is what the Advaita teachings. So 
the way to reduce this turbulence, if you're able to reduce it, we realize that universal peace in all of us. And this is the true uh, essential teachings of Advaita. So I want to finish off with a nice quote of Mahan, uh, you know, which I want you to think about very, very carefully. He says, if you look at the mirror, you'll find your true image. Your image does not become large or small to the size of the mirror. So you can change the mirror, you put a big mirror, your size doesn't change. You don't change. Or you put a small mirror, maybe you can see a limited version of you. But nevertheless, you don't change. And then he says that if the same mirror breaks into several bits, though you are one object, you'll find as many images there are, you know, as there are the bits. So this is a very profound statement by Mahan. It says that, you know, you are one. So the oneness is there. Like the ocean, there is this oneness, right? And if our, you know, mind expands or, 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 or you know, gets smaller, we are still the same. We are still the one. But if the mind fragments into multiplicity, it will see that manifestation in all the bits and bytes, right? So what he's saying here is that, that, that oneness, you know, is that one, no matter what the size and the shape, but in the different bits and bytes, the different facets of life, it is still that one. It appears. So this is what we call the DNA. DNA is that we share that one DNA. And if you look at your hair, the DNA is present. If you look at your skin, the DNA is present. The wholeness is there in all the bits and the bytes. In that same way that you universal personality and identity is one, but it appears in everything. So as Swamiji says, uh, you know, that an Advaitic master say that, you know, I am the manifestation of all and all is the manifestation of me. And this is what the oneness is. So why this is really important is that if we understand that oneness in us, that oneness could be infused in every facet of our lives, right? So while there's bits and bytes, so we, we, care, we take different, different roles in our lives, you know, in that role or as, 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 as a son or a daughter, we have that oneness. In that role as a youth or a student, we have that oneness. So we have this multiplicity of roles, but yet all of it appears as one, you know, in these different roles, you know, as a, as a, as a, a householder, as a professional, as a community leader. So he says that this oneness, one, but you know, when nature fragments it because of this multiplicity, that oneness appears fully in all of that. So, and this is what that, you know, Advaitic uh, understanding that, you know, that it's just this oneness and the fragmentation is because of nature or because of this, you know, uh, Maya or, you know, Avitya and Avarna, that super projection. So we see that our lives are projection, and that is why we see that multiplicity. Within that multiplicity, you know, the oneness is still there. That's how we see in that ocean, the surface, we have multiple waves. It's part of that one ocean. Sandosham.